Hey, thanks for joining us here today at Victory Church, where we invite people to belong before they believe. If you want to know more about who we are and what we do, or if any of our messages have impacted your life and you would like to partner with us in giving to this ministry, we invite you to do so by visiting our website at victory.church. Now, let's check out this week's message from our lead pastor, John Chesty. Hey, Victory Church, are you excited to be in the house of the Lord today? It's a joy to be back with you, Edmund Campus. I love you guys so much. It's such a pleasure to be joining you uh, this morning. Those of you watching online, maybe you just couldn't quite get out of bed this morning. The rain lulled you to sleep back in bed. But you're with us now, joining Cup of Coffee. Coffee. We have people all over the world who watch us uh, every Sunday. And so we're honored that you're joining us today. Uh, Today, I am excited to bring a message to you. um, And I want to jump right into it. We've been in this season called Strength. And... Uh, basically what we're saying during the season is that we serve the God who never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so we know that we need supernatural strength to get through this life. And so what we're doing in this series is we're going back through the Bible and we're finding men and women who were endowed with incredible strength to overcome insurmountable odds or really challenging uh, situations. And if the same God who gave them that strength then is the same God who can give us that strength today. And so I pray that this has been, been uh, ministering to you. Before I jump in, um, I want, actually, you can start turning over to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 11 if, you're, if you brought your Bibles. You can start flipping there. You can also follow on version uh, under events. You can find us and all my notes are there. Um, I wanna take a second and just thank uh, the people who spoke last week. Pastor Abdiel spoke here and crushed it. I mean, just knocked it out of the park. Um, and so, uh, Thank you, Pastor Abdiel. Pastor Philip at the Edmund campus brought a phenomenal word. And um, you might get upset sometimes that I'm not preaching, but I want you to know that that's intentional. We're fighting, I'm intentional about fighting the tendency uh, of rock star pastors. We will not build a church around one person. One of our core values is that we are not built on the talent of a few, but the sacrifice of the many. And so we want to be a church. And the good news is, is we have a deep bench. (laughs) We have a lot of really great communicators here at this church. And I'll I'll preach a lot. Uh, I'm not shying away from that. But we we are very intentional about empowering uh, other voices in the church. And I I pray that you agree with me on that. Um, Today, I'm going to bring a message to you that I've already preached once. I preached it to my kids. Uh, It didn't really work. They rolled their eyes at me and got out of the car and slammed the door in my face. It was great. Um, No, I I, I was having this conversation with my kids, and we were on our way to school. Now, you got to understand my kids. Jace just turned 12 yesterday. Happy birthday, Jace. I think he's watching today. Um, Corey turns 15 in a couple weeks. So I'm at that age where my kids are not quite adults, um, but they think they are. They're, They're not quite adults, but I can't treat them like kids. And so I told Corey recently, I said, Corey, I have one job. You're with me maybe three more years, three, four more years. Um, My task is to prepare you for hashtag adulting. And adulting is coming. There is coming a day very soon where dad's not going to pay all your bills and dad's not going to be there to pick up all your messes and, and so on and so forth. And I'm giving one of these lectures, you know, that kids hate. And we're on our way to school. And we're talking about grades and hard work and all the things that it's going to take to accomplish um, everything that God has for them and all the things that they're going to accomplish. And, and I said something, and it just came out of me. And I pray that this hits better today than it did in the car, because I think they just rolled their eyes, whatever, Dad, you know. Um, but something came out of me, and I just kind of I said, I kind of said this statement. I said, there is nothing that you will ever do on this earth without hard work. And I'm trying to just instill into them that, guys, if you don't work hard, you won't succeed. There is an element of hard work to this. And I kind of have this mantra. I say it all the time when I'm mentoring other pastors or I'm challenging someone to do something hard. I'll I'll say this, this statement. I'll say, if it were easy, everybody would do it. 
And if you ever want to do something for God, if you ever want to do something great, I promise you, you will have hardship. You will have to do hard things. And I'm just kind of pouring this out. And what I know about you, what I know about those at Edmund, what I know about those watching online, is that you are doing hard things right now. Uh, you're raising kids. <laughs> Life is hard. No matter where you turn, no matter what you're doing, I used to think that it was like seasonal. Well, if I can just get through this season, my life will get easier. It's a lie. You know what's on the other side of this hard season? Another hard season. And just when you get your kids out of diapers, you put your parents in diapers, and then you're taking care of your parents. I'm, I'm not there yet. My, my, my parents are very healthy. But it really doesn't matter. You're going to go through a season, every single season. I thought once I get them out of the car seats, parenting would be easier. Nope. I thought once they're wiping their own rear ends, life would get easier. Nope, not really. Every season has a different hardship. And so what we must do is we become, must become better at doing hard things. Some people, sometimes we present the gospel. The church and pastors and maybe myself at times is guilty of presenting the gospel like if you would just receive Jesus, everything's great. And the Holy Spirit will just roll out the red carpet and everywhere you go, doves will fly around you and you will have the favor of the Lord upon you and you will never have another hardship the rest of your life. And sometimes the gospel can be presented if we're not careful as prosperity gospel, that everything's just prosperous. And I'm all for the prosper, uh, prosperity of the Lord and I think that he wants to bless us and he wants to care for us but we are not immune to hard things on this earth. So that tells me as believers, we should become experts at doing hard things. Sometimes God does part the waters for us. And I'm thankful when he does. And I believe that we serve a miracle working God that can move any mountain and straighten any path and part any water. But what I'm also convinced of is sometimes he doesn't part the waters. Sometimes he gives me the strength to build a boat. So what I wanna to talk to you about today for just a little while is how we lean into these seasons of doing really, really hard things. And there's a guy in the Bible that we're gonna kinda of look at and focus on uh, who I believe uh, did some of the hardest things in the Bible. Now, if you look anywhere in the Bible, you won't find anybody that, didn't, that did something good for God, did something great for the kingdom, that didn't suffer hard things, that didn't become an expert at doing hard things. Um, but this particular person, I think, did a phenomenal job. <laughs> maybe, maybe went through more hardships than, than many other people in the Bible, and his name is Paul. So today, we're going to lean into a supernatural strength that I believe God gave Paul, and we're going to learn from him and see if there's some elements of this strength that we can take with us. So today, we're going to talk about Paul's strength, and the subtitle of the message is The Strength to Do Hard Things. We're gonna do hard things today. So if you have your Bibles open, turn over with me uh, to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And I must warn you, this will not be a prosperity preaching sermon, okay? Is that okay? Okay, no, but I'm gonna do it anyways. Okay, here we go. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 21, it says, whatever, so let me just context it real quick. Hold on, Nicole. Um, Paul, Paul is kind of going to have a weak moment where he kind of starts bragging about himself. He's kind of frustrated in the moment, and he's going to start bragging, talking about himself, boasting. And you'll even see a couple of points where he's like, I shouldn't say this. Who am I to boast? But I'm going to do it anyways. And so you see this come out, but he's going to list hard things that he's done. It says, whatever anyone else dares to boast about, I am speaking as a fool. I also dare to boast about. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they Abraham's descendants? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? And then he pauses, I am out of my mind for talking like this. He's like, I am more. <laughs> I have worked much harder. I've been in prison more frequently. I've been flogged more severely. I've been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. You need to find a different captain for your ship, by the way. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. 
I've been in danger from rivers, in dangers from bandits, in dangers from fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger from the city, and from da- in danger from the country. Uh, I have, I, I've been in, in, in danger at sea. I've been in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have gone, often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. And then he says, who is weak? I don't, I don't feel weak. Who is led into sin? I do not inwardly burn. If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. I came to remind us all today that with God's strength, we can do hard things. And I, I think... I'm not gonna get on a political soapbox. I'm not gonna get on any sort of bandwagon here, but I do believe that America has grown weak. I can't really speak for other nations or other cultures, but I can speak for the one that I'm in. And we live in this world where we want everything handed to us. And my generation may have started it. (laughs) I'm a Gen Xer. And Gen Xers kind of invented this whole microwave generation where everything is, is we want it done, we want it instantly. Um, I look at baby boomers and the traditionalists that, that have gone before us, these, these, these people who stormed the beaches of Normandy, you know, that brought us through the Industrial Revolution that just endured hardship after hardship after hardship. And then we're more concerned about peanut allergies than we are storming any beaches of any military zone of any kind whatsoever. And we've just kind of grown weak and we, we avoid hardship. Let's just be honest. Amazon has spoiled us. DoorDash has spoiled this guy right here. Like, you want me to, what? Go out into the woods and kill something and bring it? Are you kidding me? I can just do it right here from my phone and they'll bring me a steak right here to my doorstep. That's what I'm talking about. I'm looking for minimal effort with maximum return. Isn't that our culture? We we want minimal effort, maximum return. I want to graduate college and have an $80,000 a year job waiting on me right there. And I deserve it, don't I? My concern is that it doesn't stop with our culture. It is it is bled into the church. It's bled into even Christianity of sorts, that Christians, the people of God, are people of grit. If you look through the Bible, you will see people that have tremendous amounts of grit, that will just suffer hardship after hardship and and do hard thing after hard thing to advance the, the gospel or to do the thing that God is calling them to do. And I just wanna pause for just a moment to let you know that this is not gonna be a sermon that's bashing you over the head. This sermon is meant to be something that inspires us all to say, with God's help, I can do hard things. And there's fruit in this. There's, there's great things that happen. So, so <laughs> I like a God who does hard things for me. And I actually like to preach sermons way better about the God who does hard things for us. Because there's way more amens. I preach about the parting of the Red Sea and say that the God will part your Red Sea too. Amen. (laughs) Everyone's on board with that. And I believe that God does those things. I believe that God is a miracle working God. I do this, like I said a moment ago. But I'm also becoming more convinced than ever that sometimes God wants me to do hard things. That he's calling me to do hard things, challenging things, but I don't have to do it alone. And so, so here's what I know. There's, there's those of you in the room who, who have something pressing on your spirit or pressing on your mind that you know in the back of your mind you need to be doing this. There's something that is difficult before you that you have yet to really jump into this. And there's some of you who are in the middle of doing your hard thing and you just need some strength to endure this and to get through it. I don't, know, I don't know what it is for you. And if I set every single one of you down, I wish I could, and just hear your heart of what you think God's gonna do, but here's the challenge and here's the thing I gotta get through and here's the thing that's holding me back. There's some hard thing that's keeping you from it. Maybe it's complex, maybe it's simple. Maybe, maybe you've been sensing for a long time that you need to go back to school. 
and you need to get that degree or get that trade or go back to trade school or you need to go back and get your master's or you just need to finish what you started, finish the degree, but you're like, that's going to be hard. It's going to be hard. Um, maybe, let's just get real. Let's, let, maybe some of you are like, you know that you need to lose the weight, but you're like, I don't even know where to start. I don't, know, I don't know where to do that. It's this thing that I know that I need to do, but I don't know how to do it. Maybe, it's, maybe you need to mend that relationship, and you know you can't even comprehend how in the world that relationship would ever be mended because of the damage that's been done, and it's a hard thing, and you don't even know how to start it. Maybe it's, maybe it's like God's telling you to run a 5K. Nope, okay, cool. <laughs> it was like, nope, not that one. I'm pretty sure. Got, nope, okay. Not doing that one. Maybe there's a book stirring in you. Maybe there's a business stirring in you. Maybe there's a non- something that God is pressing on you over and over again, but you know it's gonna be a hard thing. I'll say to you the same thing that I told my kids in the car. If it were easy, everybody would do it. If God's challenging you to do it, it means it's gonna be hard. But what I want to show you today is that when we step out by faith and do hard things that God is telling us to do, we get an amazing gift that comes along beside us. So this, this isn't a, a locker room pep talk. I know so far it seems like a less locker room pep talk. I'm like, all right, let's go get them. You know, it's, it's not that. What I want to show you for the remainder of my time is I want to show you this, this element in, in, uh, first, in, in first Peter that really unlocked something for me that gave me the courage to do hard things. This is the Apostle Peter who's kind of just piggybacking off of what Paul has endured. And we, we know Peter has done some hard things too. So he says something in, in his, in his uh, writings that I want to show you. It's in 1 Peter chapter 5, if you want to flip over there. And I want to unpack something for you and reveal to you something that I believe is a word from the Lord for us uh, today. 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 6 it says, therefore, humbly, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all of your anxiety on him. That's hard. Because he cares for you. Be of sober spirit. Be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him. Firm in your faith, knowing that the same experience of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. He's saying all these hard things that, that, that you're having to do, all of these difficult tasks, all of these things, and I want you to lean in on verse 10. This is where we're gonna camp today. Verse 10 says, after. Can you say that word with me? Say after. After you have suffered, just for a little while. He wants us to know that it's not gonna be forever. It's just, it's just a season of your life. If you'll step up and do this hard thing for just a little while, for just a season, after you do this, the God of all grace, who called you in his eternal glory in Christ, will himself, watch these four things, he will perfect you, he will confirm you, he will strengthen you, and he will establish you. And these words jumped off the page at me, and I want to try my best to unpack this, and I want to take these four words. I'm going to do it through three points, but I'll, I'll share that in a minute. I want to take these four words, but I want to point out yet again the order of which this is presented, because what you know what I want? I want the strength to do it first, and then, okay, God, now I'll do the hard thing. You know, God told Gideon, go in the strength you have. So it's saying after, after you suffer a little while. Okay, well, then we gotta figure out what this word suffer means, right? So we go to the Greek. We need to always go to the, to, to the original language in which it was written. In the Greek, the Greek word for suffer is the Greek word pasco, and it means to experience a sensation or an impression of pain. So he's saying after you have experienced a sensation or an impression of pain for just a little while. Once you do that, the God of all grace is going to perfect you. He's going to confirm you. He's going to strengthen you. And he's going to establish you. So I want to unpack these four words real quick. Let's, let's dive into this for just a minute. Let's go to the first one. 
It says that God himself, he's not going to send somebody to do it for him. He says God himself is going to perfect you. When we do hard things, God steps up to the plate and said, okay, now my job kicks in. Now, it doesn't mean he's going to make you perfect. Don't look at your spouse right now. I mean, I know that you're thinking they could never be perfect. They're jacked up as jacked up can get. But it's not about, he's not, he's not going to make us perfect. It's not saying perfection. Again, let's go to the original language. Let's go to the Greek. And the Greek word for, for perfect in this text is the Greek word katatizo. And it means to restore, to prepare, to equip, and to fit or to frame. It's like this picture of the potter's wheel, like I'm making something here. I'm, I'm establishing, I'm fitting you for something here. I'm, I'm doing a work in you. In fact, the same exact Greek word, if you go and do a, a study on this, on this Greek word, there's one particular place in the New Testament that it's mentioned that I think really brings it to light. It's in Mark chapter one, verse 19, and this is when Jesus is picking out his disciples. And it says, going a little further, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were also in the boat mending, katatizo, their nets. They were restoring the nets. Why did the nets need restoring? Because those nets had been working hard. Those nets were broken. Those nets had been dragging up some fish. And through the process of hard work, there had been some tears that had taken place. So God's saying, listen, I know it's hard. The reason you think it's hard is because you're afraid of the damage that it might do to your pocketbook or to your time. But his promise to us is when we step up and say, God, I'm gonna do the hard thing that you're telling me to do. He said, okay, then I'm gonna make sure that I fix anything in you that might become broken. I'm gonna fix all that. I'm gonna mend that. I'm gonna take care of that situation. So he promises to bring restoration. He restores it. But also think about it this way. This net, they were, they were fixing it, but they weren't just fixing it for the moment. They were fixing it for the future. Why were they fixing the net? So that they could go out tomorrow and put it back to work. So it wasn't just about restoration. It was about preparation. Amen. I'm going to mend anything in you that might have issue, but I'm also in the same exact time, the exact same process, I'm preparing you to go back out to do some more fishing. There's a process. And when we do hard things, God's promises come in this process. And if you look close enough back on your life, you can see that what you used to be prepared for you for who you are. The circumstance you went through five years ago prepared you to fight the battle that you're fighting today. The job that you had 10 years ago empowered you and equipped you and prepared you to do the job that you're doing today. It's a process. It's a journey that he takes us through, and it's a perfection. Joseph was thrown in the pit before he ever made it to the palace. The pit was the process for the palace. David, before he ever sat on a throne, sat in the field watching sheep. He endured hardship. He fought a lion and a bear. That's pretty hard. I've never done that. He knew he was anointed king and he had to sit there and scoop poop for years. Knowing what he was really called to do, that's hard. But it was in the field that God was mending him and preparing him to sit on the throne. It's this process God takes us on. Noah worked really hard building a boat. It was hard work first, float second. There's a process that God's taking us through, and we, 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 we step into it knowing that after we have suffered for a little while, he's going to begin the work. So number one, he perfects us. Number two, so the second thing, I'm going to take the second and the third thing, and I'm going to combine them, and I'm going to tell you why. So this, the, the, the second point is confirm and strengthen you. Now, why are you separating those? Why are you putting those together, John? Because those are two separate words. And even in the Greek, they're two separate words, okay? They're two separate words in the Greek. But if you study this deep enough and you go down deep enough in this rabbit hole, you'll find that both of these Greek words come from the same root word. And this is cool, all right? So God showed me through my studies, these two Greek words come from the same root word. And this root word 
is the Greek word histemi. Say that with me. Say histemi. This is one of those words, kind of like katalambano in the Greek, that our English language is, can't even begin to describe. You could write books upon books about one word in the Greek because the English language cannot describe in and of itself. In fact, as I studied this and dug down too, probably a little too deep into this word, I found five key things that this one word in the Greek does. So when I tell you, when the point says that he's going to confirm you and he's going to strengthen you, I want to, I want to show you five things that I believe this means going back to the original Greek, all right? You guys still with me? You guys are super smart. You're with me. Okay, five things. Now think about this. When I step up and do hard things, God does these five things. Number one, the Greek means to, stand, to cause to stand, to be placed in position. So when you step up to do that hard thing, God says, I'm going to put you in a standing position. You are ready for this. It doesn't say he puts you in a, all right, I guess, here we go, you know. No, I'm gonna cause you to stand and I'm gonna put you in the position that I want you to be in to accomplish that hard thing. Okay, so there's a strength to it. Strengthening you to stand. The second thing that comes with this, it means to stand next to. Now, this is really beautiful. So God says, I'm gonna stand you up in a position to do hard things, and then I'm gonna come up and stand right by you. Just so you know that you don't have to do this by yourself. Have you ever been sent out by a boss to do a task, but you feel like you're all alone? You're like, okay, I'm doing this thing, but I'm on an island. I don't know what I'm doing. God's like, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. So I'm gonna put you in a position to do hard things. This is gonna be really hard, but you know what makes it easier? I'm with you. One Greek word says all this. The third thing is this. It means to give balance to. This just gets richer and richer the deeper you dive into this Greek word. If you ever do anything hard, it requires balance. Some of the hardest things in life require balance. You know raising kids requires balance? Because if you're too strict with your kids, they'll just fly off the rails and go crazy and not listen to you. But if you're not strict enough, they're gonna walk all over you. I gotta find this, I gotta find a balance to this. Leading is the same way. If I'm a domineering, authoritative leader, I'm a bad leader. If I'm a passive leader that never engages, has no relationship with my followers, I'm a bad leader. I gotta figure out how to walk this path in balance. Your finances is about balancing. If you're too frivolous and you just spend and go into debt, you're an idiot. That was kind of firm, but, but at the same time, if you're stingy, nobody wants to be around you. Nobody likes you. I gotta, I gotta find the balance. To do hard things, God's like, one, I'm going to put you in the position to do hard things. Two, I'm going to stand right next to you. Three, if you ever start to go in the ditch, either way, I'm going to help, I'm going to help balance you. I'm going to bring you that balance. And the number one question I'm asked to this day, when people find out that I'm the lead pastor of a church and the president of a university, they say, how do you do that? I'm like, it's really hard but God's grace. He's positioned me, he's with me, and he brings balance to all of it, but for the grace of God. The fourth thing this Greek word does it is translated to mean to make immovable. So he's gonna put you in a position to do really hard things. He's gonna be with you. He's gonna balance you. And if anybody tries to come up to move you, he's gonna make sure you stay grounded. He's gonna make sure that you're immovable. Why? Because you've made the decision to do something hard. And he honors that. And he comes alongside you in this process. The fifth and final thing this Greek word means, it means to stand unharmed, and to be made safe and sound. You step out with courage and do something hard. God puts you in a position and stands you up. He stands right next to you. 
He comes alongside you to make sure that you know that no one is gonna mess with you. He brings balance to this whole situation. He makes you immovable, and then he's, his head's on a swivel. You don't mess with my daughter. You don't mess with my son. He's doing hard things for the kingdom. Who wants, who wants a piece of him? You gotta come through me. It's protection. It's protection. So, what's my role? Do hard things. Do hard things. If it were easy, everybody would do it. Can you finish that for me? If it were easy, everybody would do it. Now, I gotta pause here to bring clarity to something, all right? Because this is a very dangerous sermon to preach. Because if I'm not careful, all y'all will go out and work so hard, you'll ruin your marriage. You'll work so hard, you become toxic. And before you know it, you're popping pills and sliding slot machines to cope with the pain of trying to figure out how to maneuver all this hard work. You have to have an escape. So there's, there's got to be a healthy way to do this. If we're called to do hard things as believers, what separates us doing hard things from the way the world does hard things? Okay, there's something that separates us. So I'll say it this way. God's work, God's, God's hard work, um, apart from God's empowerment, leads to hard falls. And this is why you see people build great things and then come crumbling down. Because we do the hard work, we do hard things, but we miss a really key element in this text that I want to go back and read for you in 1 Peter 5, 10. It says, after you have suffered a little while, now catch these next five words, the God of all grace. So who's gonna do this? Who's gonna give you all of these things, the God of all grace? You, we think grace is just salvation, and it is. Salvation is so much more than grace. It's God's empowerment. It's his anointing. It's his favor to do hard things. So he's saying, when you do hard things that are in, in alignment with my will, my grace comes with you. So what does this mean? Okay, this, this means that we can do hard things. The problem is we have the wrong measuring stick. Hard, we think hard things produce rewards, right? So it's the outcome. Hard work produces this. Go to school four years, get a diploma. Work at a company 10 years, get a promotion. We all, we're all focused on the outcome. So we focus in, therefore, on what we do, okay? But the proper measuring stick is not what you do. The proper measuring stick is how you are doing while you do it, okay? This is, this is mental health. This is self-care. Now, how do, we, how, what, how do we know? How do I know if the hard work that I'm doing is outside of God's grace? Well, I would tell you that, you know, in, in, in the Gospels, it, it says you can, you can know, a, you know a tree by its fruit. So on this walk, Michelle and I go on a walk every evening. There's this tree in our neighborhood that um, every year, I don't know why, every year I forget what kind of tree it is, but every year around this time, I, I'm reminded of what kind of tree it is by the fruit that comes busting out of it. I'm like, oh yeah, that is a, a green apple tree. And sometimes when my neighbors aren't looking, I will pluck one of those and eat it on the walk. And your pastor's stealing. That's awesome. Thanks for saying that, John. <laughs> So while we're doing hard things, you're producing fruit. Fruit is coming out of you. And everybody around you can identify you by your fruit. So doing hard things with Christ, with grace, will, pro will produce the fruits of the Spirit. If you do hard things with Christ, you're going to produce peace, love, joy, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. All the fruits of the Spirit are going to be coming not every day. You're going to have your weak moments when somebody cuts you off in traffic. But for the most part, the fruits of the Spirit are coming out of you. If you're doing hard work and you are popping anxiety pills and stressed out your gourd and going crazy and you're mean at people and you lose your temper, something is wrong. As believers, we have grit. We can do hard things with the fruit of the Spirit. If you're doing hard things and you don't have the fruit of the Spirit, you're either not embracing the grace that God has on you or 
you're out of God's will, and you're not doing the assignment that he's asking you to do. So what does it look like if you're doing hard things without God? Well, that's pretty easy. You're anxious, you're exhausted, you're burned out, you're unhealthy, you're out of balance. So, so that's, we, we got to do hard things, but let's do it well. Let's stay healthy in the process, okay? I wanted to say that because I don't need an email from one of you two years from now that said, you told me to do hard things, and now I lost my marriage, and I this and this and this. Well, then we did it wrong, all right? So that's, that's the disclaimer of, of that, that process. So real quick, let me go back to one thing. I got so much here. I probably need to preach more sermon than one on this. So strength, he's, he's gonna confirm you and he's gonna strengthen you. This, this is really cool. This word for strength um, in the Greek is, let me, let me go to it. In the Greek is the Greek word th- uh, nao. I said, probably said that wrong, nao, And it means to strengthen one's soul. Now we've talked about this. Your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. Do you know what keeps you from doing hard things? Your mind, your will, and your emotions. The way you think leads to the things that you do. And many times, more often than not, I don't know about you, but my feelings keep me from doing hard things. I don't feel like going to the gym today. This says that God will give you the strength. Now, the definition of strength in the Greek is to strengthen your soul. He's going to strengthen the very thing that keeps you from doing hard things as you step out by faith. And that's why I think Paul says in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. You could say that in a different translation, I can do hard things through Christ who gives me strength. Let's go to the last one. The last one says he will establish you. He will establish you. In the Greek, this word means he will lay a foundation in you. He will, to found, to make stable, to settle. So we, we want hard work to show fruit in the building of a structure. I want my hard work, I want to look out the window and see what I built going vertical, up. God says, yeah, but first we need to work on the foundation. You don't want to build a giant business and then it crumble because your foundation was all out of whack. So God's promise to us is when we step out and start doing hard things, he's like, you do that, I'm gonna go to work on your foundation. I'm gonna do some work here, some, some things that need to happen. So he's preparing something for us that then can, can bear weight. My son, um, he's 12, I'm 6'7", I have no doubt he's gonna be tall, maybe taller than me. He's a rail. He's as skinny as a rail. Like he, he eats nothing but goldfish and gummy bears. And the kid like is skinny as a rail. I can fit my hand around his thigh. That's how skinny this boy is. And so um, I'm, I've started taking him to the gym to work out with me. I was like, all right, bud, we're going to work out. Because he wants to play football next year. I'm like, you're going to die. So <laughs> we're going to put some muscle on you. Protein. You have to... And I was trying to explain to him in the gym the other day. He was like, I'm sore I, I, from what we did the other day. I said, you know why you're sore? And I'm no doctor, no medical expert, but I said, I said, you're sore because actually when you work out, the muscle fibers in that muscle group that you've worked out are actually shredding. They're tearing. It's, it's damaging, in a sense, your muscle fibers. Your body responds by sending healthy cells to build it back, but it doesn't just build it back, it builds it back stronger. That's why your muscles will grow if you work out. You know why most people don't work out? Because it's hard. It's painful. You sweat. The same thing happens to us when we do hard things. There is a tearing, there is a sense of this is hard work, it's strenuous. It would be much easier to play my Xbox and to watch Netflix and order DoorDash. But when we do hard things, remember, point number one, God promises to come back and mend things back together. And in the mending, he's also preparing for something better. So in the mending process, he's actually building you back stronger. 
for the next hard thing you're going to do. That's encouraging, isn't it? But you know what? It won't be near as hard. It, to think what I do now, if you'd have told me 10 years ago that I was going to do what I'm doing now, I'd have told you you're insane. There's no way I could do that. What I see God do over the course of my life is as I step in to do hard things, he makes sure that I'm established, he's with me, he stands me up, he's balancing me, he's protecting me in the process, and he's building me back stronger. Five years from now, I'll be doing something harder than I'm doing right now. I don't know what it is. How does all that come about? When we step up and do hard things. When we aren't satisfied with just living through life, waiting for somebody else to do my miracle. Waiting for handouts. Could you help me? Can you help me? Can you? I'm all fine with helping one another. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. We should. But there should be some fire in your gut that tells you I need to step up and do hard things. Many of you are doing <laughs> incredibly hard things. I, there's people in our church doing crazy hard things. Uh, at the Edmond campus, there, there's this couple, their name is Mickey and Rochelle Rain, uh, Fuller. And they are amazing. They both work, they both have, have jobs. Um, Mickey, they're, they're involved in the church. Mickey's mentoring other men, doing incredible things. And all the while, they're raising two children with Down syndrome. Two. They had one, biologically, and they went out and adopted another Down syndrome child from Russia. Now, do you know what that means? Like, you know that when your kids get 18, you can... They're not moving out. Ever. That's hard. Some of you are doing wildly hard things, and I don't discount that. So this sermon is both to inspire you to do hard things, but some of you are already doing really hard things. And you just need the reminder that you have the strength of God on your side. There is nothing you can't do. There is nothing you can't do. You can do hard things through Christ who gives you strength. You can do this. I don't know what it is that, that is prompting you right now. I don't know. Like I said earlier, I'd, I'd love to sit every one of you down and be like, what's the one thing for five years you've known you need to do, but you just hesitate to, to do it? Everybody's got something. It, it could be as hard. Some of you are battling something as hard as fighting cancer. It could be as hard as fighting cancer all the way down to just working for a boss without killing them. You know? it, could be, it could be any breadth of, of and, and your hard thing is not easier or harder than someone else's hard thing. It's all about your hard thing. And your hard thing is hard. For somebody watching online today, the hardest thing for you is to get out of bed because you're so depressed. You didn't even come to church today because you're so depressed you can't, couldn't come. I don't know what your hard thing is, but what I do know is that through Christ, you can do hard things. And there is a supernatural strength that can come over us. Maybe, I do know that if it were easy, everybody would do it. Maybe, maybe God's challenging you, you're in your 60s and you feel like you're supposed to start a new career and you're like, that's crazy. That sounds hard. If it were easy, maybe, maybe it's this, man, I'm in my 40s, I'm in my 50s, and I started my degree, I never finished it. Maybe you're thinking about going back to trade school to be a welder or a plumber, but you've got this career. And the, 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 the thought of doing that, we have single moms, single dads that are doing hard things, the thought of doing that. I don't know, I don't know what it is. Maybe, maybe it's to start the business that everyone has told you won't work. It's too hard. Maybe, maybe you need to lose the weight so you can play with your grandkids someday. Maybe you're five pounds in to losing the weight, but you're just discouraged about trying to keep this thing going. Guys, if it were easy, <laughs> I'm 
Let me just pray for you. Father, I know that I know that I know that many times instead of doing the hard thing for us, you call us to do hard things for you. Father, I pray for every single person listening to this message right now, God, that there's that ginormous, crazy thing that's in front of them that just seems impossible. To mend that relationship just seems impossible. To, to heal the relationship with an ex-spouse seems impossible. To be the dad that I know that I need to be seems impossible. To stop the addiction seems impossible. But God, I pray that today something clicks in us, that we understand that this, many times the strength to do it doesn't come first, that after we step up and do hard things, the God of all grace. So God, I pray that as we step up, as we make decisions to step out in faith, God, I pray that this passage in 1 Peter would come to life for us individually that we would supernaturally feel and sense your empowerment, God, that you're coming and you're perfecting us. You are confirming us. You are strengthening us and you are establishing us. We will do hard things for you, God. We thank you for the empowerment that comes with it. In Jesus' name. Thank you for joining us here today for this week's message. And here at Victory Church, we are called to equip people to live in His presence, move beyond ourselves, and be transformed. And this can only happen through your radical generosity, your serving, and your prayers. If this message or any of our messages have impacted your life and you would like to partner with us by giving into this ministry, you can do so by visiting our website at victory.church/give. Thank you again for joining us and have a great day.